Hello everyone! In this video we'll cover deterministic simulations in DSG models, also known as perfect foresight simulations, and how you can do this in Dynair. So first we will cover very briefly the intuition behind this method. Second, I'm going to illustrate several scenarios that you can analyze using perfect foresight simulations on a two-country new Keynesian DSG model as an example. And third, I will go through the Dynair-specific commands that you need to know and change for your application, but then we will actually dive deep and go under the hood of Dynair and actually derive the Newton type algorithm that Dynair uses and discuss some numerical issues that we need to deal with. And to make sure that we really understand the algorithm and the way that Dynair conducts the simulation, we are actually going to re-implement it manually in MATLAB and see whether our outcome is exactly the same to the outcome of Dynair. There's a link in the description of the video to all the codes and slides that I use in this video. All right, let's go. So let me briefly start with a quick recap on deterministic simulations. The idea is that we are looking at a model under perfect foresight. So the agents in our model, they perfectly anticipate all future events, all shocks, all policy changes that will occur. And to be more precisely, in the impact period, let's call this period one, the agents of my model, they learn the value of all future shocks and or any policy changes that will occur. They, based on this, they will compute optimal plans for all future periods, and there is no need to adjust anything in the following period or later on. So the model behaves as if it were deterministic. So there is no decision rule that I need to compute or I don't need to take uncertainty into account. The unknowns that we search for, mathematically speaking, are trajectories for the variables of my model, not a decision rule. So given my dynamic model equations and initial values and a certain shock scenario, I want to find, for a certain period of time, I want to find values for all my endogenous variables. And of course, there is a cost to this, okay? So obviously the effect of future uncertainty is not taken into account. So there is no motive for precautionary savings. Also very important to understand that the only surprise that happens in the model is on impact, okay? That is where unexpected shocks occur and this is when agents start to react optimally. This is also very important if you have a shock scenario where a change or a shock is announced in future periods, the announcement is the surprise and it happens on the impact period. So those are the costs basically, but there are of course advantages to this method. The numerical solution that we can compute is exactly up to some numerical rounding errors. Contrary to what we typically have with uh, stochastic solution methods like perturbation or, um, or projection or value function iterations, for rational expectation models where we have an approximation error. The nonlinearities in my model are also fully taken into account. So if you have a kink in your uh, policy rule, for instance, due to an occasionally binding constraint, and this will be taken into account. Now, what are the typical applications for such a simulation? Well, first of all, this is often used to get an initial impression of your model. So initial model assessment, a first glance of the propagation of shocks, and then we might um, go further and try stochastic simulations. Um, on the other hand, certain predictable structural changes like the introduction of new, new taxes or a, a new currency, um, such scenarios are often analyzed with perfect foresight simulations. Another application for which we commonly use perfect foresight simulations are long-run simulations. So say we go from one steady state to another and I'm interested in the trajectory, how we get there. And of course, also if you want to analyze very large models with thousands or ten thousands of equations um, or you have very large shocks um, such that local solution methods like perturbation are not accurate enough or you have kinks or like many nonlinearities in your model, then we rely on deterministic simulations in many applications. So let me give you a few examples what you can do. So 
I will use a two country New Keynesian DSG model with a zero lower bound on interest rates. So let's have a look at the model equations first. So I'm going to use Dynair 5.4 for the illustration and let's have a look at the model equations. So we have a basic New Keynesian model and there is trade between the two countries. Okay, so I have loads of variables that I need to declare for the home and the foreign country like production, consumption, uh, wages, nominal interest rates, investment, capital, etc. Some Lagrange multipliers. I am going to look at this model in its full nonlinear version. So the Calvo pricing will be set up in its recursive representation. Um, I have an ex the real exchange rate and the change in the nominal exchange rates. I have a little bit of government spending in the model and taxes, transfers, um, investment specific technology shocks, bonds that are traded and also government bonds. And I have a couple of exogenous variables on TFP, on government spending shock, tax shocks, uh, monetary policy shock and in investment specific technology. Uh, productivity shock. So a bunch of parameters. Um, all right. And then the model equation. So basically, since I have two countries, I have the same equation more or less two times. Define real exchange rates. Um, I have the dynamic law of one price, um, a couple of definitions, and then the typical New Keynesian models, um, the optimal re price setting, um, recursions, etc. Okay, so a bunch of more model equations. How I am implementing the zero lower bound, I'm simply implementing this with a max operator. Okay, so the net interest rate must be greater than zero. So the calibration is rather standard, um, nothing to it, not much. Um, I'm shutting off many of the fiscal policy rules, but feel free to play around with that. Okay, so I'm able to compute the steady state of the model in closed form. So I have a steady state model block, right? And it's a bit messy here, but at the end, this mode file computes a steady state. So let's run this mode file. This is called like that. And let's hope there is no error. All right, as you can see, I normalized everything more or less to one. Okay, so my inflation target is one and this means that many of those relative prices also will be one. Fine, okie dokie. Now let's do our first simulation, a temporary monetary policy shock. And it is a surprise, meaning it happens on impact. Okay, so let me open the corresponding mode file. And what I'm going to do, instead of me copy and pasting the model equations one more time and then including the commands f that do the actual simulation, I'm simply using the NAS macro preprocessing capabilities. I include the mode file that we just saw with this command. It will just put the text in here and then run the course, the new mode file. So how do you do a surprise monetary policy shock? You, with perfect foresight, you say which shock you want to change in which period, the impact period one, and I want to have a 15 basis points change in the monetary policy rule. Then there is a command perfect foresight setup, which initializes the values that are used for the Newton type algorithm and the perfect foresight solver command actually runs the simulation. And we have an option period. So I'm going to simulate over a hundred periods. And then I want to have plots and I typically write a function in MATLAB that does the plot. So if I open this function, it basically gets output, consumption, annualized inflation, annualized nominal interest rates, the tax rate and the monetary policy shock out of the simulated variables. I will talk about those structures in a moment. So for output consumption, I compute 
the, those variables as a percentage deviation from steady state, um, annualized inflation and nominal interest rates and the tax rate are computed in deviation from steady state in basis points and the monetary policy shock is also computed in basis points. So I then create figures. So I'm going to plot the home variable and the foreign variable, create a legend, create a grid, and that's it. Okay, so for output, consumption, income tax rate, annualized inflation, annualized nominal interest rate, monetary policy shock, that's it. So I have a two by three figure. All right, so this is my plotting function. This is pure MATLAB code. I pass on a title to the figure, the horizon of the IRFs, the horizon that I want to look at the simulations and the output structure of Dynair and the model structure of Dynair. All right, so let's go back to my perfect foresight simulation of a temporary monetary policy shock. All right, so let's run this. This is called temp monpol surprise. And you see that a couple of iterations were done and I get these nice looking pictures. Okay, so I have a monetary policy shock that goes up by 15 basis points. This raises interest rates by more than 400 basis points, um, lowers inflation in the home country, but has a spillover on the foreign country, etc. Okay, so these are the trajectories that we computed. So that was a temporary monetary policy shock. Now let's have a look at a temporary monetary policy shock that is pre-announced. So I'm going to run a simulation where the central bank tells me I'm going to raise interest rates in a year by uh, 75 basis points. And then in two years, I'm going to raise again by 25 basis points. Okay, so how can you do such a simulation in Dynair? So let's open the corresponding mode file. Again, I'm including the model equations and I'm using another shocks block, very basic, very similar to my previous command. But here I'm saying that in period four, there will be a 75 basis points increase. And in period five to eight, there's going to be additional 25 basis points increases. Okay, so those are pre-announced again the only surprise that happened is on impact and we will see this in the plots. So let me run this. So this is a pre-announced monetary policy shock in home and you see that even though stuff happens um, in quarters five and beyond, um, you see that people are already reacting to this change optimally. Okay, so you see here the monetary policy shock when it goes up by 75 basis points, then by 25 basis points, and you see the corresponding change. And as we also have a zero lower bound in the model, you do see that we are hitting this zero lower bound here as well. Now, what about a permanent increase in the inflation target? And that is a surprise. So today the central bank announces that um, they are going to change their inflation target from zero to two percent annually. What happens with my model? So there is one parameter that is the target. There's this parameter that is the target of the central bank. And in the baseline, this target is just one. And here I want to have it two percent annualized. So 0.5 percent quarterly. Um, I'm going to change that and I'm going to use a end val block. So I'm going to recompute the steady state. I'm going to start in a point in a steady state where the inflation target is one. And I want to go to another steady state where the inflation target is 2% annually or 0.5% quarterly. I'm using again perfect foresight setup to set up initial values of my simulations. And then I'm going to use a Newton type solution algorithm by running this command and plotting again. So let me run this. 
you see that on impact the inflation target changes and that has immediate effects on all the variables but in the long run my inflation my annualized inflation target will be at two percent or 200 basis points um, and we get there rather quickly um, this of course has implications on the nominal interest rate but the spillovers to the other country are not as huge as the own effects and the last example I want to give you is a permanent increase in a tax rate we have an income tax in this model and this is pre-announced so the um, simulation that I'm going to run is that today the government tells me that say again in the year they are going to change the tax rate to a certain value they're going to increase this but this is going to happen uh, in periods five and following okay so first of all let me show you how the tax rate is determined in the model okay so we have a tax rate that is right here so basically I have a parameter that sets a target for the tax rate and I am putting a shock on this tax rate so I could either change the parameter or I can increase the exogenous var variable here and I'm going to choose the later approach because this gives me some more flexibility so in the baseline this parameter tau h was zero so there was no tax and I'm going to increase this by 10 basis points okay so my initial point is I'm going to do, do it via the exogenous variable so the exogenous variable is zero and I'm going to compute the initial steady state then I'm going to increase the exogenous variable by 10 basis points and want to compute the new steady state uh, whenever the exogenous variable is not 0 but 0 0.1 okay and this can be done by the endval block followed by a steady state by a steady command now I want to have a pre-announced tax increase so the first five periods there is not going to be any tax increase okay afterwards the tax will increase but not in the first five periods and I'm going do, to do this by using a shocks block and I'm going to set this value the first five periods to zero afterwards it gets the new value from my end file block okay so let me run the simulations here okay prepare my perfect foresight simulation run the solver do the plots so the income tax rate the first five periods nothing happens and then it jumps up okay and stays at 0.1 now this of course has immediate effects the announcement alone has of course effects on what people do they uh, already consume more so output increases and you see that there are also spillovers to the other country okay so I hope you saw that there are many scenarios menu simulations that you can do with perfect foresight simulations and there were a couple of Dynair specific commands that I going to provide you now a summary of there is an init val block where you specify the initial values where the simulation starts and if the init val block is followed by a steady state we start at the we are going to compute the steady state here then there is an end val block and this enables me to change variables at my terminal point and if this command is followed by a steady command the terminal point will also be a steady state you can also use histval for initial or terminal conditions out of steady state I didn't show you an example but there is this block as well um, there is the shocks block um, for shocks along the simulation path and then there are the two commands perfect foresight setup which prepares the simulation and perfect foresight solver that computes the simulation now under the hood the trajectories the paths the values for the exogenous and the in endogenous variables are stored in two matrices and uh, so we have in dynair this oo underscore structure which, which is 
um, in general our results structure. And you have OO underscore endosimo. This stores the paths for the endogenous variables. Okay, so you have your initial point, you have the simulated points, and you have the terminal point. And there is a similar structure called exosimo in OO underscore, and this stores the shocks, the values for the shocks. Okay, so for historical reasons, the dimensions of those two matrices are a little bit different, particularly the dates, the periods in OO and OSIMO are in the columns of that matrix, but they are in the rows or in the lines of OO exosimo. Now, what does the perfect foresight setup command do? It initializes those matrices. Okay, so the OO endosimo and OO exosimo matrices. And it takes into account what you put into the shocks, the init file, the end file, or a hist file block. And more precisely, the initial value and the end value or the terminal value and all the shocks that are those are fixed, those are the constraints of our simulation problem. The first period up to uppercase T periods, all those simulated values are the initial guesses for the Newton algorithm and, and the Newton type algorithm is then run called by the command perfect foresight solver. And this replaces your initial guess um, in OO endosimo by the solution or by the simulation done under perfect foresight. Now let's have a look at the actual algorithm. So briefly, what is the model framework that we are working with? Again, we are working in a deterministic world under perfect foresight. So there are no expectation terms that I have here. And the model that, or the model class that we are concerned can, all models can be basically cast into these very general framework where F are my model equations, my dynamic model equations, yt plus one are all my endogenous in future period t plus one or in current period t or in back period t minus one and the vector of my shocks. And those are basically my model equations, put them all on one side of the equation so you get a system of equations and this is my DSG model or in a very general framework. Now, what if your model contains more than one lead or one leg? It doesn't matter because such models can be transformed into this form where we only have one lead and one leg by using auxiliary variables. So for instance, if you have a variable xt plus two, um, what you can do is create a new auxiliary variable, call it a, and then replace in your mode file whenever there is x plus two, replace that with a plus one. And then at the end, add a new equation where you say that A equals X plus one. Now the same can also be done in stochastic models. There the um, taking into account future uncertainty is a little bit more tricky, but still possible using auxiliary variables. And the beauty, those transformations are done automatically by Dynair. You don't have to wor worry about that. All right, so let's have a look at the mathematical problem that we're facing. It is a two boundary value problem. So let's stack our system for the perfect foresight simulation over a number of uppercase T periods. Okay, so I need to find values Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, whoop, up to YT and the constraints that I have is my initial value, y0, my terminal value, yt plus one, and the sequence of shocks. Okay, so those are given. And in each period, in each simulation period, my model equations need to be fulfilled. Okay, so this is why I'm stacking for each simulation period, everything one on top of each other, and I'm calling this uppercase F of uppercase Y, where Y basically is the matrix of all my endogenous variables in period one, in period two, and in period YT. Now the goal is to find 
a trajectory for y where this system is exactly fulfilled. So fy needs to be equal to zero. This is the goal and the solution, how we can achieve that is a new, via Newton type iterations. So a brief recap on the Newton method in the univariate case. Um, so say you have a function and you want to find a certain point where the function is zero. This is exactly what we want to do here, but in the multivariate case. Okay, I want to find the point y where f of y is exactly zero. So new univariate case, what you can do is start somewhere. All right, so let's say I'm going to start here, my initial guess. What is the function value at this initial guess? Okay, this is, and is this zero or not? Mm, it's not. Now, which direction should I go? And one idea is to, let's have a look at the, a linear approximation in the vicinity of this point. So at the tangent and see when this has a value of zero. So let's go down here. Now, how do you compute this value x2? Well, basically this is a triangle and you can compute via the slope, uh, via the formula. Now, this is my new guess value. Recompute the function value. Do again a linear approximation. Go to whenever that is zero and there is a formula how you can compute that very easily. Okay, so what is the function value then there? Do another linear approximation and you see that we are getting closer and closer to the true point where the actual function is zero. And this is the whole idea of the Newton method. So the key formula is this one. This is in the univariate case, but it works just the same in the multivariate case. So this is the perfect foresight algorithm. You start from an initial guess, let's call this y0, and this incorporates your simulation scenario, so the values for the shocks and the uh, initial and terminal points that you want to go through. And then you iterate, like just like we did in the previous example, according to the Newton algorithm. That is, you update a, the solution, so let's call this yk plus one, by solving a linear system, okay? So, and this is the formula that we are solving. So basically the new guess value is the old one minus Jacobian times the function evaluated at the old value. This is exactly the same formula as here, okay? New value, old value minus inverse Jacobian times the function evaluated at the old value. Okay, and this is the formula and we iterate. And we iterate until the change from one iteration to the other is extremely small or the computed residuals of my dynamic stack, dynamic models are, the norm of those are extremely small, some epsilon. Now, of course, convergence of the Newton type algorithm is something that is not guaranteed, okay? so. Sometimes your functions, your model is ill-behaved or more often your initial guess is way too far from the solution. And so you could run into infinite loops and we typically set a maximum number of iterations and then Dynair tells you perfect for so slight solution not found if the, that number is passed. Now, there are some options for the Newton type algorithm, um, options that you can pass to the perfect foresight solver. So there is the max it option, which is the maximum number of iterations uh, before aborting. By default, we set it to 50. There is the epsilon f, which is tall f, the convergence criterion based on the function value. And here the default is 10 to the power of minus five. And the same default is also for the convergence criterion based on the function argument. And then there is a last option here, the stack solve algo option, which enables you to change or to switch the flavor of Newton uh, of the Newton algorithm, because we have several ones that you can use. And what about the initial guess? 
So the Newton algorithm needs an initial guess, y0. And by default, if there is no endval block, it is the steady state specified by initval. And this will be repeated for all, say you, you're simulating over 100 periods, for all 100 periods you are initializing this OO endosimo with the initial steady state. Now, if you have an endval block, then the terminal steady state will be used for the 100 periods for the initial values, except the very first period that is updated with the initial steady state. Now, possibly if you are, if you are having a model where it is very hard for the Newton type algorithm to converge, there are ways to uh, change those initial values that uh, might work better. Manually manipulate this after calling perfect foresight setup, but before calling the perfect foresight solver. Now, so far I've only talked about finite number of periods t. Uh, and technically we only compute the trajectory for a finite number. Now, what about an infinite horizon problem? Say you are interested in how do I get from one steady state to another one? So this is actually an infinite time horizon problem where T goes to infinity. Now, one option or the more accurate option would be to actually compute recursive policy functions and then say as with perturbation methods and then use those to find the trajectory. But this is very challenging and this is something um, that Daniel does not do that with perfect foresight simulations. What we do or the easier way is we are going to approximate the solution of an infinite horizon problem by a finite horizon problem by setting simply t large enough. Now the drawback is of course the solution is very specific to the given sequence of shocks and not generic but it is numerically very easy to handle and you can see in your plots whether or not the uh, simulation converges to the new steady state or not or if you need to increase the number of periods. Now the key object that we have that we need to compute is the Jacobian matrix of my dynamic model equations. Now the shape of this Jacobian for each time period, you have to take the derivative with respect to t minus one variables, t variables, and t plus one variables. So let me call a the derivatives with respect to t minus one, b the derivatives with respect to t, and c the derivatives with respect to t plus one. And I have to do this over the simulation period. So for t lowercase t equals one, equals two, equals three, equals up to uppercase t. And except for the very first period and the last period, we always have A, B, and C matrices. So we have a block diagonal right here, but the first and the last period is special because here I'm missing the previous derivative and here I'm missing the forward-looking derivative because I'm already at the terminal um, point. So this is the Jacobian. You can see that there are many, many zeros right there and right there, but it is a huge object. And to be even more precise, if you have T periods with N endogenous variables, this matrix has dimension N times T by N times T. Now this is a huge matrix and I need to invert this matrix. And there are different ways to do that. Previous to Dynair 4.2, the default method was to actually look into this structure of the J Jacobian and then use relaxation method or technique um, to exploit is the certain block diagonal structure and never store this Jacobian in full, but really do it recursively. Okay, so this was the default method previous to four, Dynair 4.2 and it is still available with stacks of ALGO 6. The default method now is, well, this matrix is huge, but it, it contains many, many zeros. So it is actually a huge sparse matrix. And 
there are many numerical algorithms that are now optimized due to vectorization to deal with sparse matrices and it's very easy, very um, straightforward to compute the in say the inverse of a very large sparse matrix, so a matrix that has many zeros in there. So this is the stack solve algo equals to zero algorithm. Then there are different flavors basically to those two algorithms. You can also combine that with a block decomposition where you look at the individual equations in your model because some of those equations are purely recursive, like uh, law of motions of TFP for instance. Uh, some are basically just definitions, uh, like output is a function of capital and labor. And then there are there are, is uh, another block of functions that have both forward and backward looking variables. So I have different blocks and I can compute the Jacobian on the different blocks and then combine that. I'm just going to talk about the default method about the sparse matrices right now. Okay, so what is a sparse matrix? Um, so consider the following example. We have matrix A and there are only two values that are non-zero. So if I'm going to store the whole matrix with the zeros in a so-called column major order, so 0, minus 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2.5, 0, 0, I need to store all nine elements of that in a one-dimensional array. So this is typically what a computer does under the hood, even though this is a matrix, it stores this as a, an array. Now, a sparse matrix storage l views this array or this matrix as a list of three entries. Okay, so we have i and j, this is the matrix coordinate, which row and which column, and which value, which non-zero value. So I would store this matrix as 2, 1, so second row, first column, and the value is minus 3, and 1, 3, and the value is 2.5. Okay, so you already see that here I need to store nine entries, and here I only need to store two entries. And given a matrix with dimension m by n that has, say, k non-zero elements, this dense matrix storage requires to uh, 8 times m times n bytes of storage. The sparse matrix representation requires 16 times k bytes. Now, assuming 32-bit integers and 64-bit floating point numbers, you see that the sparse storage is way more memory efficient as soon as k, so the number of non-zero elements, is less than number of rows times number of columns divided by 2. And in practice, sparse storage becomes very interesting if this difference is very large. And the reason is linear algebra algorithms that we have, that our computer uses, are vectorized and they can deal with sparse matrices very easily and very fast. In our problem, the Jacobian that we have, it is highly sparse. Okay, we already saw that there are so many zeros on the, not on the block diagonal, but on the outsides there, it's full of zeros. But actually the individual A, B and C matrices at each period in time also contain many, many zeros. So those are also highly sparse. And using the optimized algorithms on sparse matrices, it is very easy, very fast, and very accurate to compute, say, the inverse of that matrix, which we will then need for the Newton algorithm. And in MATLAB, creating a sparse matrix is basically just run the sparse command on the matrix, and it will create this matrix, and you don't have to worry. You can compute inverses and multiplications and divisions just as you did before, but MATLAB uses optimized algorithms to deal with sparse matrices. Okay, so, so much for the theory. Now, to make sure that we really understood the algorithm, we're actually going to re-implement it manually in MATLAB. Let's first clear everything, rerun the mode file, and store a couple of options and numbers of endogenous variables and number of exogenous shock variables. So the first step is to manually create the initial matrices. Okay, so we had in the mode file an initval block, an endval block, and a shocks block. So whenever there is an endval block, the endosemal structure uh, matrix 
the, the endosimal matrix is initialized at this value. And remember, we have stored that value in a variable called ys1. Okay, so let's take this variable ys1 and repeat it for the initial period, for the number of simulations that I want to do, and for the end period. Now we did have an init val block as well, so the actual very first period needs to be different. And here I'm going to use the ys0 variable that stored the initial steady state. Okay. Now let's see whether the so created endosimal matrix is the same as in um, Dynair. Okay, remember I had in my mode file, I created or I stored the initial values in this variable and this should give me a logical one. Okay, so now we know how initval and endval block basically work. Okay, so let's create an error if something is not wrong, if something, if that is not equal, I'll print an error here. Okay. Now let's initialize the exogenous variables. Let's first create the matrix, fill it with zeros. So remember due to historical reasons, um, the time periods are now in the rows. Um, so we have the initial time period, the number of simulations and the end period and the number of exogenous. So we initialize that, but we had a shocks block. Okay, so we had a shocks block, meaning that after period five, the epsilon for the, on the tags changed its value to 0 0.1. So let's do this. So we have the initial period that we want to keep for five periods, the epsilon equal to zero, but then we want to change it to, we want to change the column of corresponding to that name to 0 0.1. And again, let me check whether my such created exosimo is equal to the one that I stored from Dynair. So if they are not equal, I should see a error. Double check, is this really equal to each other? Yes, okay. So remember I need to, I have a initial point, let's call this y init, and I have a terminal point, let's call this y end. And now let's create this big matrix Y, which has only values for T equals one up to uppercase T. So no initial and end values. Okay, so very important to distinguish. Y has only values for uppercase T entries, whereas endosimal and exosimal have two more entries, the initial and the terminal point. Okay, so how do you create this matrix Y, well, we use the endosimal structure that we just created, the initial values, but we start not in the first, but we start in the second period and don't go all the way, but only for T periods. And we take, we have NY variables at each time period times T. So this is the matrix Y. This is the um, uppercase Y that I also used in my notes. Next, we're going to run the Newton algorithm. So one, two, the iterations and the option, how many iterations we want to do is stored in this max it. This was equal to 50. Okay, so I don't want to have infinite loops if something goes wrong. So I have an upper bound on iterations. Okay, now I need to first create, okay, so create stacked vector of model residuals and stacked Jacobian. This is the very first step and the most difficult one. So let's first initialize those two, the stacked vector of model residuals. It has ny times t entries and only one column. And the Jacobian is of course ny times t, the same number of rows here, and is the Jacobian, so with respect to all the variables here. All right, so this is 
initialized with zeros and now we're going to fill them with the actual Jacobian. And we're going to do this iteratively. Okay, so for t equals 1 to t. And first I'm going to get the current u. Okay, so remember exosimal starts in the uh, initial period. So I'm actually going to use t plus 1 here and get the value for all the exogenous values. And then I need to compute y t minus 1, y t and y t plus 1. So lower case. Okay, so have a look at this code. If I am in the very first period, my y back is actually my y0. So this will be my initial value. The very first one, I get this out of this big matrix y. These are the first n y um, rows. And the next one are the next n y rows. Okay, so this is then y2. The next period, say t equals 2, my back my yt minus 1, I can update this with the previously computed curve. I can update the yt with the previously computed t minus 1. And the next one I'll get out of my big matrix y. Um, I have to count how many ny's, uh, how many periods times ny's I, uh, I need to go down plus the next ny entries. All right. And the Last period is again special because the y forward is needs to be set to yt plus 1, so the end value. Okay, so those are my endogenous variables at yt minus 1, at yt and yt plus 1. And I'm going to use this to compute the dynamic residuals of my model equations and the Jacobian of my model equations. Now, Dynair has um, computed those into script files and we can very uh, and we can easily um, evaluate the script files to compute both the residuals and the Jacobian okay and I will the code for that looks like this so basically the file that we need to evaluate is the so-called dynamic file and this is enabling me to compute the residuals of my model equation, of my dynamic model equations, and the Jacobian of my dynamic model equations. And the, what I need, I need to provide values for all yt minus 1, yt, and yt plus 1 variables. I need to provide values for the u, for the shocks, values for the parameters, and maybe I have a steady state operator in my model, so I need to update that as well. Dynair stores the Jacobian um, only with respect to the variables that do appear in the model. Okay, so this saves a little bit of storage space. We will change that in later Dynair versions, but for now this is still true. So be careful that um, the script files that we evaluate here, the G1, um, the first columns are actually only for the variables that do the predetermined variables that actually appear in the model, then come the variables that actually appear in period t, and then the actually appearing variables in t plus 1, and then the columns for the shocks. Okay, so this is the command to evaluate that Jacobian. Um, my Newton algorithm, where I set this up, this big matrix, this with these a, b, and c submatrices, this requires, of course, the Jacobian with respect to all variables. So let's initialize this A, B and C matrix with a bunch of zeros and then update the co columns with the entries of my Jacobian. Okay, and this lead lag incidence matrix basically encodes the um, information on which columns I am going to choose or I need to choose. Let me provide a comment here. The Newton algorithm, however, requires the Jacobian for all yt minus 1, yt and yt plus 1. So we initialize with zeros and update the correct values right there. Okay, and now let's create the stacked Jacobian. And remember that the first and last period 
are special. Okay, so in the very first period, my Jacobian, I need to only focus on the B and C matrix because there is no A matrix there. And when in the very last period, I only have that A and B matrix, for all other periods, I'm stacking A, B and C matrices. So this is the way to compute the stacked Jacobian. And now let me also create the stacked residuals. There you go. All right, let's make these matrices sparse by simply calling the sparse command in MATLAB. Very easy. So I do not really have to worry about that anymore. Now let's double check whether my for loop here creates the, the same stacked residuals and stacked Jacobian as Dynair does. Dynair doesn't use this for loop. It actually has a function written in C++ that is much faster, more efficient um, to create those stacked matrices. And you can call it um, like that. It is called perfect foresight problem. It is a compiled mesh file and the input arguments are basically the capital Y matrix, my initial and my endpoint, the object of my exogenous, the parameters, the steady state. So all the things that I also used to evaluate the dynamic script files. Let me call this din F and din DF. So for instance, let's start with the very first iteration, right? Um, let's run this code first. Let's run the very first iteration and let's create the stacked Jacobian right here. Let's do the same with Dynair and let's check if they are equal. So if not, the I will get an error. Fine, no error here. Okay, so now you know how to create the Jacobian and the stacked residuals. And now we do the Newton step. The difference of the old YK and YK plus one, let's call this DY, is equal to minus the inverse of DF times F. Okay, or a little bit more robust in MATLAB, you can compute, since I don't want to store the inverse, I only want to compute that, I can use the slash operator right here. And this is then the Newton step. And then I can compute my new y equals old y plus this change. Okay. And of course I had those terminal conditions. So for instance, let's error compute the error of say the model equations, the dynamic model equations. And if this error is less than 10 to the power of minus five, then break the for loop stop. You found a good Y. Okay. If not, then actually do the Newton step. Okay, now let's run this whole script right here. Done. No errors. So all for all periods, all iterations, my stack Jacobian, my stack model equations were exactly the same as Dynair computed them. And now let's double check whether my actual simulation that I have generated is the same as the one of Dynair. Okay, so let me um, reshape this Y matrix again to get this endosimo right here. And now compare whether my computed endosimo is the same as the one of Dynair. Yes, it is. And that's it. That's the deterministic simulation on the perfect foresight algorithm. It's a Newton step that we're performing. And I hope you found this instructive. Um, feel free to raise your comments or point me towards errors that I did in the script in this video. And I will answer that in the comments below. Bye bye.